Now let's move over to the United States and see what's happening in those markets. Now, the biggest thing that people are talking about in the United States is reporting and record keeping requirements for PFAS under Section 8A7 of the Toxic Substance Control Act. And what this is, is a requirement to report the use of manufacturer and import of PFAS into the United States under Part 705 of Title 40 of the Code of Federal Regulations. The reporting period doesn't start until November of this year and goes through May of 2025, with that period extended for smaller manufacturers. And what this requirement mandates is that manufacturers and importers of PFAS or importers of PFAS containing articles specifically, and this is what gets the electronics industry in scope, in any year from January 1st, 2011 to November 13th, 2023. So we're talking a 12 year span. They have to report electronically information on which PFAS was present in those imported articles, the production or import volumes, the disposal information, uh, exposure and hazard information. So basically a great detailed data set needs to be submitted to EPA covering 12 years of uh, article imports into the US of PFAS present in those articles. Now, making this more of a challenge is that uh, just like we saw earlier, the scope of PFAS is slightly different in than any of the other requirements like the EU ban or any other kind of PFAS restrictions that we're seeing out there. It's got a unique structural definition. So just because we know a PFAS is present doesn't necessarily mean that it's reportable under this requirement. So this requires a little bit of chemistry to be applied to ensure that we're reporting correctly. Luckily, EPA has identified um, 12,697 PFAS that are on their inventory that meet the structural definition. And they provided that in the form of a reference list that they continue to update. So we can reference that list to see, well, which PFAS really meet that structural def definition. We don't necessarily have to be a chemist to produce, to, to figure that out. But we do have to keep in mind that if we are aware that a PFAS is present that's not on that list, we need to check and make sure it doesn't meet the structural definition, because even if it's not on the reference list, if it meets the structural definition, it's still in scope to be reported. The information will be submitted uh, to EPA using their central data exchange system, which already exists today, and they are creating a streamlined reporting form that's going to be provided for importers of articles. So importers of articles will face a slightly different mandate than producers of raw PFAS within the the United States. So what it basically says, manufacturers who have imported a PFAS within an article must report the required information to the extent they know or can reasonably ascertain. That's worded right into the regulation. And what this tells us is that EPA is aware that going back to 2011, we may not be able to figure out every single you know, PFAS chemical that was in every single article that we imported. But to the extent we're able to figure that out, we're supposed to try and provide that to them. Now, what information are we going to have to submit under Section 8A7? Well, the information that, that's relevant in the streamlined reporting form includes things like, you know, your company name and the site information that you're importing or using those articles, and then chemical-specific information, like the common or the trade name of the PFAS compound in use, the identity, like CAS number, the TSCA accession number, maybe the low volume exemption number, whatever kind of uh, identifier that you have needs to be included. And then the molecular structure of that PFAS, which if you have the cast number, that's already known. But if you don't, you may have to provide the molecular structure of the PFAS that you've been using. Now, getting into categories of use, you need to disclose um, how the PFAS was used inside the article. So this is not necessarily the use of the article. Um, but the use of the PFAS itself, was it used as a flame retardant? Was it used as a cleanser? Was it used as a stabilizer or a colorant? Um, that kind of thing. Um, and that's done with a functional category that's picked from a pick list. Right? So you have to disclose that information. And then you also need to disclose how the PFAS is being used by you, in which case you would choose code U, right? which is non-incorporative activities, because you're not incorporating the PFAS chemical into the article yourself, but rather you're importing an article which has already had the PFAS incorporated into it by somebody else before you imported it. So code U is what you would use in that case. There's so other information that we have to provide on the use of this PFAS, 
the sector code, which is going to be the sector of the industry that your product is used in. For example, if you make a laptop computer, you would choose code IS41, which is computer and electronic product manufacturing. That's where you're using that article. Um, additionally, you need to provide the consumer and commercial use information. So how is the end product going to be used in this case? You know, if it was a laptop computer, I would choose the example shown here, CC220, other machinery, mechanical appliances, and electronic and electrical articles. And we also need to disclose whether it's used for consumer or commercial use, or both, and if it's used by children. When we're providing this information, we need to disclose the estimated maximum concentration of the PFAS in the product or in the article, and as well as the imported volume. And when they talk about imported volume for article importers, they're talking about the quantity of articles and units that are imported or the tonnage of units, not necessarily the quantity of the PFAS itself. Now, once you provide this information to EPA, you have to keep that for a period of five years because they may come back to you and want to review that information with you. And remember, this is a one-time submission requirement. You don't have to repeat this. So once you've made your reporting and and, and um, submitted through the CDX in the reporting window, you've met the requirement permanently. This is a fact-finding mission on the behalf of EPA to determine where PFAS is being used in the United States, which PFAS is being used, so that they can move forward with legislation in the future. This is not going to be an ongoing requirement. Watch the full-length video and gain access to our full archive of educational webinars at greensofttech.com videos. And while you're there, learn about our premier solutions for environmental regulation compliance.